greeting everyone i am dr deependra from conceptual orthopedic and i welcome you all in today's connect session with fahim sir and uh, today sir is going to discuss pulseless uh, and on a supracondylar fracture humerus so i think this talk is going to be very useful to all of you so without any further delay i welcome you sir on the board and i request you to start your presentation now it's over to dr fahim sir thank you dr deependra so uh, yes so today we are going to uh, cover the uh, next aspects of uh, a pulseless hand so this is a very controversial topic uh, to start off with and uh, i'll try my best not to be uh, say uh, uh, try not to be uh, kya bolte hain let's not create any confusions okay so let's like try to keep it uh, simple fine so my presentation has just crashed <laughs> okay so uh, uh, whenever we have a supracondylar humerus fracture about say about half of them uh, do present with uh, some sort of a uh, neurovascular injury okay so uh, yes it's back all right yes so uh, whenever we have a supracondylar humerus fracture about half of them do present with some sort of a neurovascular compromise okay it could be as simple as something like a, a neuropraxia of the anterior interosseous nerve or it could be something as severe as a pale pulseless hand with no perfusion and compartments and all so uh, this is a wide spectrum of uh, uh, presentations that we can get and it is important Uh, that we identify the simple ones from the really grave ones because it is um, it is criminal to miss out on a pale pulseless hand because it has grave long term complications okay so when we talk about pulseless hand okay so fracture displacement may cause injury to the surrounding soft tissues including the brachial artery as well as the median and radial nerves now uh, we know that the brachial artery as well as the median nerve travel to uh, travel close together in the anterior aspect of the fora okay and there is a reported neurovascular injury as high as 49% out of which the vascular compromise is seen in up to 20% of the patients okay now the brachial artery gets stretched or kinked over the displaced fracture fragment so this displacement takes place over the proximal fragment I'm allowed to show you here. Yeah. So as we have the artery coming down in this region, this gets transected in this region here, where the proximal portion comes anteriorly and e either directly or indirectly damages the brachial artery. now this is particularly positive or particularly important when the brachial artery is tethered by the ulnar sided supratrochlear branch of the brachial artery now the supratrochlear branch will go medially and this is the supratrochlear branch now when it is tethered on one side by the supratrochlear artery and the other side by the brachial artery itself and the fracture comes forward so both sides it is tethered and the fracture comes in pierces or damages the artery whereas when there is no tether distally where there is no tether distally of the supratrochlear artery or if it's a low supracondylar humerus fracture then this tethering is not of problem okay so imagine if the fracture is lower down here then both the tethers of the brachial artery as well as this is tether number 1 and this is tether number 2 if the fracture fragment itself is distal to both the tethers then it, there is a less likelihood than it is causing a brachial artery injury okay so somewhere in between these two is where the injury does take place okay now types of vascular injuries can either be direct or indirect now whenever there is a direct injury to the brachial artery it can be a contusion it can be compression by adjacent soft tissues there could be an intimal injury where only the 
uh, inner most layer of the artery is involved and this would later lead to a delayed thrombus formation or a aneurysm bar pseudo aneurysm okay then we have the partially lacerated or completely transected brachial artery these can also be seen in a small category of patients you can also see the brachial artery which gets entrapped within the fracture site okay so if we are having the fracture somewhere over here going backwards we have the artery coming from the forwards getting entrapped within this and then coming out so reduction again makes the artery go into the fracture site and come out okay <laughs> so uh, these are the different types of presentations that a vascular injury can come with but how do we know which category does our patient fall into it is very difficult it is very difficult to tell which category our patients fall into and it is also not important which category our patient forms into because we need to save the patient's limb here okay it does not matter which sort of injury it has because the treatment for almost all of them requires exploration okay so time is of essence so an early exploration is more important rather than finding out what is the a uh, type of injury and then treating it at its merit okay now arterial injuries may lead to a compromised perfusion of the extremity resulting in a potentially catastrophic consequence if not recognized and treated promptly in the case of a pulseless limb following supracondylar fracture with a median nerve deficit the suspicion of arterial injury should be elevated this is important because the median and brachial median nerve and the brachial artery both travel together so if the medial nerve is injured and there is a pulseless hand then the suspicion for an arterial injury should be very 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 high okay now given the anatomic proximity of the median nerve to the brachial artery injury to one structure may predict injury to the other as well okay now remember this is complete median nerve injury and not anterior interosseous nerve injury okay we are talking about complete median nerve injury and brachial artery injury happening together now the initial uh, evaluation 